happy Monday, guys, and uh, welcome to uh, the latest show that we have with Tim Bertram. And uh, for uh, a lot of you guys that know Tim, uh, he's certainly one of the main innovators we're seeing in dentistry today, especially with his mastery of uh, removable partial dentures and the way it's 3D printed. So I'd like to welcome Tim to our show. Tim? Thanks for Thank joining you. us today. Thank you very much for the invite and having me. Um, very nice that you guys reached out and have an interest in RPD is the uh, redheaded stepchild of the dental industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I uh, appreciate the invite and that's uh, nice to be here. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit before the program starting up here on some of the history and, and uh, the technology. Uh, it seems like RPDs are, are uh, kind of the, always a category that, that lags behind in technology, but um, we've been really focused on trying to bring that technology to RPDs and be the partner for labs and be able to help them um, once they, you know, have a CAD design and are looking for some place to manufacture that. Well, I mean, by way of intro, people are always wondering, you know, how does one end up running an RPD lab, specifically a digital RPD lab? Like, did you wake up one day and say, this is what I want to be when I grow up? <laughs> or you know, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, well, um, no, not exactly that that story, but I think like a lot of people in the industry, they have family around them that introduces them to that. And um, that's the case here too. My grandfather, he did uh, Chrome. He did it. He was a frame lab uh, named uh, Precision Chrome in the 50s. He eventually sold that lab to Denticon. Um, then my dad, William Bertram, and my uncle, Tom Bertram, they started Bertram Dental Lab in 1976 and have been running it until uh, my cousin Joe and myself made the purchase in 2018 and we've been running it since and really doing our best to find those efficiencies and and uh, do the technology and, and bring things digital but to clarify we we still do a lot of uh, investment casting um, Due to due to capacity limits that we're at right now, but we still do a lot of investment casting, but we do a lot of digital too. And and if you look at your business today, I mean, what percentage would be digital versus traditional? We're getting close to that fifty percent mark right now, where um, we're getting our files that we're receiving from labs. You know, here's here's a CAD design of an RPD just manufacture this is really grown, um, especially in the last year, exponentially. Um, so we've had to ramp our production um, as quickly as we can to accommodate those labs and, uh, and be that resource that they can send to. And, and so backtracking your, you know, you take over the lab in 2018 and uh, you and your cousin, I mean, I'm assuming you're a lot younger than the generation before you. Right. And you go, okay, we've got these awesome ideas. Like, what were you doing before you took over? And, you know, what kind of changes did you want to do once once you and your cousin took over? Uh, good question. Um, I was doing, so I did designing. When I say designing, I'm not talking sitting behind a computer. I'm talking traditional survey and design of a model. I did that for 10 years um, <laughs> by hand, just drawing 40, 50 RPDs wow. a day. Um, and after- That's fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe's way faster than I am. Um, so he probably does 60, 70 solo. Wow. Um, just survey wow. and design. Yeah, he can he can do some great work and his team, too, that he's got, you know, of, of designers that are just drawing. And, you know, we take that drawing and we scan that and we we use three shape and we have the texture scan. And obviously we're CAD designing off of that. Um, but anyways, to your earlier question, 
in I'll say 2014 ish was when I started um, working with three shape and learning the CAD designing and then when we made the purchase of the lab in 2018 then one of the big things in buying the company was I knew at that time we didn't want anything to anything to do with the real estate that was involved with the business um, we knew we wanted to make a move to a larger facility um, so we so we did not I'll say renew that lease and then we made a purchase of our own building um, so we could scale up because we wanted to scale up our production with the SLM metal printers. So those were the two big items as far as, you know, how can we scale up this, this metal printing and, and how can we get a bigger facility? And that's been our focus the last three years. So let's do a, a quick survey before uh, uh, we see what questions people are asking. I mean, primarily, you know who here is involved in in partial dentures you know so the, yes they make them in-house uh yes they outsource them or no just to get an idea of the knowledge level of the people that are watching us today and uh while we're filling that in a uh, couple of the questions here uh well, someone's asking what exactly do you guys do do you just make the frames or the entire rpd Oh, great question. Uh, we do just the frames, just the chrome work. If somebody really wants to have some acrylic work done, we do work with a local lab. And but honestly, that's that's not the workflow we really want to do with a lot of. We want to work with those labs that you know they're doing their setups, and we can provide the frame. Yeah. So, and uh, the audience we have, you know, a good what 60, 76 percent of it. Uh, 77% almost are actually familiar with partials and they do them in-house or outsource them. So we've got the right crowd that uh, okay. is curious to learn about, about you. And so, I mean, fast forward to today, you know, uh, you mentioned you guys do uh, primarily framework, 50% digital, 50% analog. And uh, from what I've heard from people that have, uh, been dealing with you. A, they love your work. I mean, no, thank you. You know, you you seem to have mastered something that I know I I never mastered, which is producing RPDs at scale. Right? I mean, you guys do a lot of volume and and do it consistently, and the quality and the fit is good or great. So, uh, the feedback from our clients has been that. You guys are, are one of the best in the industry that, that they've dealt with. And how does one get to that level of expertise and scale, I guess, is, is my question. Right? Yeah, we've we've got a lot of key key employees that have, you know, 30, 40 years, and that's a big factor, just like you know, any lab. I have a lot of respect for full service labs because I think it's gotta be extremely difficult to maintain all those different product lines and the knowledge where we're just focusing on, you know, we do a very small volume of flexible partials, but our main focus with the, the metal frameworks, um, you know, we have that knowledge for training. The only thing we've really had to do in the last 10 years is obviously the digital to learn that, master that, and then grow that, that side of the business. Yeah, and I mean, are you a big fan of the the digital side of the business? Do you would you prefer customer sent it to you digitally or traditionally? Um, that's a tough question because we get that question a lot. I would mm -hmm. prefer two one of two workflows. One would be they're either shipping a, a stone model, and mm -hmm. we can physically draw on that model, scan that model, and then do a CAD design, and then do the final fit to the model that was actually scanned or that lab is doing their own CAD design and sending the, the CAD designed frame for us to print. And we can offer that frame sent back to them, you know, sandblasted or a pre-polished finish. So it's, I'll say, you still got to do that, that last 5% of fitted to the model and confirm everything looks good, but it's cutting a ton of time down for them. Do you 3D print your models as well? We don't. 
I, that was a, that so was still a, pour them. yeah, we still pour them where we receive the models from, from the customers. It just seems like most labs we work with already have their own model printer. So are they, oh, I see. Willing so they to, to yeah, are they really going to really be willing to pay for us to print it? So yeah, oh, they'll okay. ship us, they'll ship us the, the 3d printed model if that's the, what they have. Yeah, that, that's one of the questions I, I, I saw on the screen. If you don't know much about partials, uh, how would you start sending frames to you? Could you walk me through the pro process? And I guess, uh, at least if I paraphrase, correct me if I understood wrong, you have two methodologies. One, you know, you'd prefer clients send you the impression or, or, the, and then or the you stone digitize. Model. Or the stone model, and you digitize yep. that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second is uh, you'd prefer clients send you files that have already been designed, and then you print those. Correct. Uh, and uh, I know you've been swamped. Uh, are you taking on new clients now, or uh, maybe waiting until you've got more capacity? We're as far as um, analog workflow, like physically sending a model, we haven't been able okay. to accept new accounts now for about six months. Uh, we are starting a, a waiting list as far as people that are looking to send STLs of already designed frames. Um, we're at capacity right now there as well, but we are adding on a fifth printer um, this month. So that's gonna bump up a little bit and we're gonna you know keep that keep that list of uh, people that would like to send to us so we can reach out to them and and to give the uh the uh audience some insight i mean you're not talking about you know ten thousand dollar printers on the tabletop here you've got these monstrous yeah. machines that cost a million dollars each right yeah about that about that price range uh 13 feet long um run on I think it's 408 volts three phase so it's it's quite a production and uh, you need argon or nitrogen um, gas inert gas to to run them and we're adding on uh, our full nitrogen bank system this month as well where we're going to be completely self-reliant on generating our own nitrogen in-house as well instead <laughs> of uh Wow. Yeah, instead of buying the bottles, which we've been doing for a long time, big big 12 bank bottles we've been buying, um, now we'll just generate our own nitrogen. So uh, how does one generate their own nitrogen? <laughs> I'm just curious. And like, the, do you have to go to the Department of Defense to say, uh, I've got to generate my own nitrogen here? <laughs> no, no, no. You just, <laughs> you just got to grease the right wheels, I guess. <laughs> No, it's 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 yeah. really it's really common in a lot of industries actually. Even packaging, um, like food packaging, they they use a lot of these uh, gas generating systems. So they're definitely out there. Um, this particular system is coming from Belgium company that makes uh, compressors. It's called Atlas Copco. Pretty common in the compressor world. So yeah, we're really excited to get this in house. Everything's all plumbed up, ready to go. We just need to have the power hook up and uh, we'll be set. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating just listening to you because the, the RPD business, if you just focus on the RPDs, it's a totally different business than the labs, right? right. I mean, the machinery is different, the, you know, the requirements for whether it's, you know, nitrogen or uh, argon or whatever else, I mean, to do it at scale requires a focus that is hard if you're already doing crowns, bridges, implants, and then you're going to add this to your repertoire. It's not that simple. Right, yeah, it is definitely. And I can see why, you know, casting over the years, to your point, all the, all the equipment involved with casting any kind of volume of RPDs uh, takes a lot. So you have to have that whole department and either you have a department and you have enough work to scale that a little bit, or at that point, if you don't, it's probably worth outsourcing um, and not yeah. dealing with it. 
Now, I know uh, a lot of guys would love to hear uh, what's your insight into the future of dental laboratories? Because you're very digital, uh, mm -hmm. half your work at scale, you know, and, and again, this is not the tabletop digital, as I call it. This is a full digital production facility. Yeah. Uh, where do you see the future of, you know, starting with removables and even fixed, whether it's implants or what, like how, how do you see that panning out in the future? I, I just see it expanding exponentially from where we're at. You know, I think um, the world market is growing. Um, borders mm -hmm. are getting closer, so whether you like that or not. Um, and I think IT is is a huge role, as, as I'm sure most people know, in their labs. Uh, we have a full-time IT director. We hired on another IT person and their ability to make the digital side really flow is very critical. You know, when you're talking about how you get, how are you getting your files? Whether, you know, whether you're a retail lab and you're working with dentists and how are they uploading to you? Is that, is that efficient? Is that trackable? As well as when you're talking on, you know, in scale, are you getting hundreds of files a day that you have to, you have to have organization, you have to have tracking. And IT is going to be the leader in this field, in this field's growth, as we know, whether it's software or your internal software for how you, how you handle those files. I mean, that's a great point uh, because you're the first person that's ever mentioned that of all the discussions that, that, that I've had the last 18 months. And, you know, what, what people are not thinking through is once you, you go digital, you've got two issues. Number one, how do you store and protect the privacy of that information? That's your right. responsibility. And then the second is, okay, whenever someone's looking for a file, before, I remember when I started in the lab business, we had 12 people. I would stand up from my bench and go, okay, who's got Mr. Smith's case? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and just pray that, you know, and pray that no one dropped the veneer or the crown and uh, you know that it's actually there, right? And right. How do you do that digitally? Right, right. And we, and that's, that's, you got to have your process down, you know, how we, we back up our files internally um, at certain time intervals. And um, we still store, we still store the actual paper RXs that we get in house, but I'd love to get to the point we're not there yet where those are getting scanned and, and we can house that, you know, just that scan data. Yeah, well, uh, I, I'm happy to introduce you to the guys uh, evident that manage that because we're doing that for a lot of people right now. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. So we we just uh, upload. I mean, separate top topic altogether, but uh, historical uh, prescriptions. You know how we had to store prescriptions seven to ten years, depending on what state you're in, and uh, all the paper prescriptions. We have a, a methodology to scan upload it and then you can access it so it's just part of the, the service that we've been offering so uh but you're right i mean that's one of the big challenges you know what we're seeing with labs is they're receiving digital files from i don't know 10 12 different sources everyone's got their own portal you've yep. got someone sitting at that desk just dragging and dropping all of these right into one spot i mean that's a Fifty thousand dollar expense a year just to have someone sitting there pulling files back and forth, and then you've got to find them and figure out where they are and curate them. And then, in your case, if you're running a digital process, you've also got to let people know when the files are coming back, when they expect them, so right. that they can put them in their production flow. Right. Right. Everybody. Everybody. You know wants to wants to have that information when when can i get it back and that's um easier with a digital workflow because one thing that we do in house is um we call it the dominoes tracker you know you go order your dominoes pizza and you see <laughs> when it leaves when it leaves here when it's there and then when it's going to be delivered um and we're continuously trying to develop and improve on that where 
you know, when, when this print gets done in the printer, we set the status. So that status is updated and that's live internally. And then when it gets out of post-processing, that status gets updated. And when it leaves the finishing department, that status gets updated. And then the last thing would be the tracking number gets posted to that final step. And uh, yeah. that's just easier with a digital yeah. workflow. Yeah, uh, I imagine in, a, in an analog workflow, you've got someone that has to data entry that stuff. And again, right. And because prints yeah. for us are in a batch size, you know, that's just, you know, in this print, let's say you have 40 cases or 40 case pan numbers. Well, then you can group them all together. Okay, this 40, that status is completed. Let's move, to, it's moving to the next status of production. Now, one of the things that has driven me nuts, at least when we started uh, printing and milling in, in the labs that the, I owned previous to Evident, uh, when you print a batch, how do you identify, you know, what tooth or what crown or what <laughs> goes to what? Do you put numbers in the inside of the uh, RPDs? Oh, that's a great question. And, and that's something we've struggled with um, because we can we could either try to put a number like you're saying on the RPD inside or maybe like a like a little tags, let's say like a little yeah. tag hanging off of it. Um, but that's going to add a fair amount of time on our end, tagging and IDing each each part. Um, so what we actually do is a screenshot, and that's kind of our bottleneck for logging in. We've we've made things yeah. efficient efficient as possible for logging cases in, but we take a screenshot of the RPD that posts to the job, and then we ID it by just literally looking at looking at the part compared to the picture. I, it just comes from, uh, you know, like I said, when, when I when I owned labs, and we would do a full mouth case and mill all the uh, the the veneers and the crowds, and then you're trying to figure out, okay, which veneer goes to what? And, yeah, and how do you do you that? Because you can't you can't do like a screenshot like I'm talking with that. That's there's not enough, you know, things identifying on a picture to help you. Yeah, what we would do is exactly the same, those screenshot of the puck and then by hand oh, mark put it. numbers to it. Yeah. Uh, but some of the then some of the milling machines started to to come up with their own uh, methodology that you could actually add numbers to the back of uh, to the uh, lingual of, you know, whether it's a veneer or a or mm -hmm. a crown. And what uh, I'm thinking is that I mean, full disclosure, we designed a number of partials for, for Bertram. You gave me an idea that uh, after this, I'll go back to the guys and let them know if we can start putting some numbers, at least the ones that come from evident, you can track them a mm -hmm. bit more easier if we put some numbers in the back. And I'm pretty sure we can get, you know, some of the software developers we have to figure that out. Yeah. It'll just make life simpler, yeah? Yeah. I mean, we, I'm not saying it's foolproof. Uh, I'd be lying if I said we never sent the wrong case out, but it's we're pretty accurate. It's those cases yeah. that, you know, you have your your typical two canines remaining and you might have two cases that look very, very close that uh, those are the ones that make it a little tough. Yeah. And uh, I mean, how do you scale up a business like yours? So I, you've already got a, let me backtrack. I think you're at the point that you can already scale up because you've got the infrastructure, you've got the people, you've got the technology. Sure. And a lot of this is your own intellectual property. So, you know, uh, good for you that you've developed these secret processes in your lab. But let's backtrack, you know, three, four, five years ago when you're thinking of doing this. Uh, like, what are the challenges you had to go through? Uh, a lot, a lot of R and D was, uh, you know, like anybody bringing in a new, a new piece of equipment or machinery, we had to figure out how to be efficient in the CAD workflow, the supporting and nesting, I'll call it workflow. And that's a totally different software, um, than most labs use for nesting or supporting their printing. Um, 
once a, once a, a print of RPDs is completed, we have to heat treat that. So we had to figure out and learn the heat treat process for that. And then now you have, for us, a batch size of 40 to 45 partials on a plate. How do you get these, how do you get these partials off a plate? So some people in the 3D printing world would use a bandsaw is one method that works. Uh, personally, I don't like it. We don't use that. We use an EDM machine. Um, and it's What's an EDM machine. It's amazing. It's a, it's a electric discharge machine. It's used in the machining world. It's a piece of brass wire, 12 thousandths of an inch thick that cuts the parts it just cuts metal using deionized water wow yeah so the deionized water flows over over the the plate and the wire is actually the conductor the water does not conduct electricity as you would think it would it's actually an insulator because it's deionized and then it cuts the parts from the plate with way more accuracy than a bandsaw would and then it also leaves your plate much cleaner because we resurface our own plates in house. We have a, a grinding machine to resurface and we reuse our own plates then. Wow. I mean, again, the, I, I think it's great for people to get context that this is not about tumbling some cast partials, you know, right? In, yeah. in a closet that you've got uh, with the machine that's 80 years old right. that uh, is sitting there, right? And which I've seen in many labs before. Uh, this is truly about bleeding edge technology and taking pieces from different uh, parts of the machining world and put them, putting them to use in the, in the lab business. Right, and, I, and I'm no G-code expert and that's what it takes to run an EDM. I, we literally know what we need to know. How do you cut left to right? X, Y, that's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and don't stick your finger in there. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> but you're right. It's it's adapting. It's adapting old old uh, machining technology um, that's still current, but um, works perfect for this. And and that industry as a whole is also trying to adapt because, um, for example, uh, GF machining, or sometimes people call it the old Charmi. They make a machine now that's specifically geared towards additive manufacturing and and metal printing and just cutting parts off, which they've never had before. And that's called the AM500. It's a huge machine if you're doing big, big builds. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, again, this is, I, I know a lot about the lab business. I have to admit partials or something that, you know, I'm, I'm probably the worst at. Uh, uh, and uh, only because through my career and all the labs I've owned, We've struggled to to make partials work, you know. It, right. It's just tough. So right. that's why I'm so impressed with what you've done. I mean, what makes a good removables department in your eyes? And everyone's complaining about the shortage of people and right. You know, Tra training uh, is is really the, the 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 difficulty right now. Um, you know, to have somebody that has the knowledge to share. And having somebody that can do a survey and design, I'm talking a traditional survey and design on a model with a pencil and a surveyor is invaluable. You know, whether you're doing digital or analog, you know, that doesn't matter because well, like with us, we're doing it either way, we're doing a survey and, des survey and design on a model. And then that's either going to our waxing team who is by hand, you know, laying a pattern, waxing it, investment cast, or we're sending it to CAD. And I mean, like in our case, a year ago, we had, oh gosh, we would get one or two digital RPDs a day. Yeah. And today we get hundreds. Wow. And uh, so we've had to build our own digital RPD team. Uh, and I've, I've just been surprised at the rate of growth of, you know, digital RPDs. I mean, if you asked me a year ago, would that be one of the products going digital? I would have said no. But yeah. now people are are pushing, and you know you're certainly getting a lot of that as as uh, you know the leading one of the leading labs in the United States today. Sure. Uh, 
are you seeing that? Are you seeing that the ratios of digital is going up? Yes, for sure. Um, especially like we talked about earlier, the files of just people out there that are learning how to CAD design their own frames um, and, and looking for somebody to manufacture is really growing. And like uh, relative to doing it in-house and outsourcing to you, is it more expensive or less expensive? To to do it in-house or versus sending out? Yeah. It, in my opinion, it has to be cheaper to send out. And if you if you talk about the cost, you know, and it really depends if you have some of the equipment already or not. If if you have a big capital investment that you have to recoup and you don't have a lot of volume, then definitely cheaper to outsource. If you have if you have enough volume and you have a team in-house and you have enough volume, it, it you know, it could be financially worth it but then you have to be willing to to maintain that training and that knowledge and and that equipment um which can take a lot of space as you know uh, for that department too to maintain and floor space etc yeah i mean uh, i i have this discussion a lot with people and what i tell them is to figure out what your lab's main core competency will be mm -hmm. and build your team around that and everything else, go and and find an outsource par partner that can work with you and scale up with you. Because the biggest expense, uh, as I tell people, it's not the time a technician does to go and design something. That's only one component. You've right. got the capital costs. You've got the software, hardware, all the updates, you know, subscription fees. You factor that in. Then you've got the training and recruiting costs which right. is pretty big in this industry. I mean, where are you going to find the RPD experts at scale? You might be able to find one, might be able to find two, but try and find 10. Right. You know, right. <laughs> you're going to have to, then, you're going to have to grow them yourself. Yeah. And while you're growing them, you're investing a lot of the capital to do that. So you've got technology, you've got equipment, and then you've got management costs and brain space. To me, yep. that's the biggest issue because it requires someone to, to stay on it full time. I mean, guys like you or us, we're already at the scale that we have management infrastructure. But I'll tell you, my, my biggest cost is training and development. Sure. Because you take people out of production, you school them for, you know, in our case, months at a time, you, we rotate them through training. And that really becomes your biggest expense because it's non-productive costs, right? So right, right. I think people have a hard time understanding that. Um, what do you see? Here's a question. What do you think is the biggest game changer uh, to date in RPDs? And what are you seeing as the biggest game changer coming up? Oh, that's a tough one. I th well, obviously CAD in the last five years maybe eight years has been a, the biggest game changer, whether that, that CAD file is going to be printed in resin and do they do print to cast or whether they're doing uh, metal printing with selective laser melting technology. Um, but I do think in the future, there's going to be, there's going to be more materials that are going to come to the foreground as far as, you know, the flexible materials that, you know, we, we mill some of those materials. Uh, we work with a partner on milling, milling those flexibles, but I think you were talking earlier about uh, the zirconia materials, wow. things like, things like that, you know, non-metal related materials that are going to be, that are going to continue to be in the market. And then the flip side, this, what do you see your biggest challenge in scaling up? Because I know personally, you've got a lineup of labs yep. wanting to send you work. And, uh, you know, you're very selective about who you take on, rightfully so. Right. And, you know, what do you think the, the rate limiting factor is for you? For us, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, you know, which, which amount of these labs are going to go digital? Which... Because right now you have your you have your I'll say more traditional labs that 
they want to ship a model and be very hands off and, and have a partner like us to do the do the design and send them a frame. And we'll be able to scale up more easily with customers that have their CAD team or they're working with Evident and uh, getting those designs and then we can manufacture them. Uh, we'll be able to scale up with those type of customers that are embracing the digital more so. So like the, the traditional stuff and yeah, I can see where the challenges are in scaling up traditional manufacturing of, of uh, cast partials, right? It's just, right. it's tough to get that talent, man. And not only that, you're now competing with Amazon and some of the other guys, FedEx, UPS, oh. who are all trying to take that, that, you know, labor force away and have them go switch there, you know? Right. So, right. Yeah. But I, I know a guy who uh, runs a restaurant chain in the U.S., a good buddy of mine, and he's having to pay $1,500 signing bonuses to go have people come work for him in the restaurant. Really? Is, yeah, is, he, saying, uh, is he setting any type of time frame? I know they need to be there for X amount of time. Yeah, 90 days. So if okay. they stay 90 days, they'll get the 1500 Actually, he gives $500 up front and a thousand bucks after 90 days. So, okay. and, and he goes, okay, otherwise I'm not getting people applying. And yeah, well, we, yeah. in the first time um, history of our lab, we recently hired a full-time HR person. And, um, you know, we had, we've just grown to the point where we needed one. And I think the timing was good because like, to your point, it's a tough market and to have somebody focused every day on, on getting us the, the right people and looking at those people um, has been very helpful. She's been doing a great job. And, and that's why I, I caution labs. I go, guys, you know, factor in that you're going to need a recruiter or recruiting costs, training costs, hardware, software, and then management costs unless it becomes a core business for you, you're better off to find, you know, guys like Tim and send the work to them. Right. right. And, um, and, you know, and in the end, there's, for? sorry, go ahead. Sorry. And, sorry, and, ahead. and then to your earlier question, and in the end, whether you had asked me about the cost, the cost of keeping it in house versus sending it out. Well, we're not really able to compare apples to apples or either, because if you're keeping it in house, you're casting it. And while that is a good product, if you want the SLM frames, there's there's not as many places to get that right now. So that that you have to keep in your mind as well. And I think the demand for SLM frames is going to continue to grow. I think the word is out that they're a good product and they're very uh, efficiently made. And I like to think the uh, precision on them you know, look at the details on them is, is very good. So uh, someone's asking, what do you look for in an RPD tech? Are there any traits that uh, let you know the guy is good or at least can be trained to be good? <laughs> That's a great <laughs> question because I haven't found any. <laughs> right. It's, it's really, you know, you're just looking for somebody that has some manual dexterity maybe a, a little bit of mechanical ability. It doesn't need to be RPD related, but if you know they can work on um, hobbies or crafts or their cars or some, some mechanical aptitude, I feel an RPD is, is helpful for design. And then second, like, like everybody, you're looking for somebody that's dependable, that you can count on, that's not calling in and wants to learn. That's the hardest part. You gotta, if you can find somebody that just is willing and wanting to learn, you should be able to fit them somewhere in your lab that they that they can work. So how, how do you test for someone that wants to learn? So we do a model test currently where we, uh -huh. we make a duplicate model and we have a basic pencil drawing of an RPD on a model and we ask them to copy it. And then we look at, you know, how accurately and, and nicely drawn is that duplicate copy of our original drawing. Got it. Okay. 
So uh, you're looking for someone with a bit of aptitude towards drawing and being able to translate something visual into something written, and then uh, the desire to learn about how this whole process pans out. So yeah, exactly. And do you tend to find uh, kids who are well versed in video games, or, or like, is there a specific background that that works better? Well, we had we had some gamers recruited for CAD that have worked in the past, but I don't really feel like you need to have people that are necessarily gamers for CAD. It just I feel as bad as it sounds to say, people that are anywhere forty and younger have grown up on this technology and they have enough knowledge base to to do what you need for CAD. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think 15 years ago, you know, technology was a, a new thing. But nowadays, you know, if you haven't grown up with technology, it's kind of like where you've been. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> where it's you've just, been hiding. Right. It just it been comes more jail. natural. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, here's a funny question. Is there some secret to running a removables department? I was talking to some buddies and the trend seems to be that all of our removable departments are gong shows. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to tell you on that one. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, in, in my career, I've, I've uh, struggled to uh make removables departments uh as profitable as the fix it's i I'm, in a nice way i would tend to agree with this uh, uh last question you know they, not that they're gong shows it just i could never get them to to be as profitable as the fix departments but i think things are changing now you know? right but i still think you're gonna have a you're gonna have a premium on fixed i don't think mm -hmm. that's just my opinion i don't think you're gonna I'll say margin wise, improve and beat fixed gross margins. So they have, what I'm seeing though, is the fixed is actually getting pushed down and the removables are going up. Yeah. You know? Well, we haven't, hard to moved, find. I mean, we haven't moved up that, that much in the last five years. You know, our, our price point has stayed pretty steady. I mean, that's been good of you. Yeah. Um, but, but I've seen re this year prices go up on other labs, removable labs, Chrome labs. I've, you know, what, it, what I've heard from uh, competitors. And a lot of that has to do with uh, consumable costs. Uh, with COVID, yeah. there's been people, there's been labs, Chrome labs out there that can't even cast. They've, they can't get investment. Um, they can't get wax patterns or we're having the, the patterns problems. We're having to use other brands of patterns we've never used before because we can't get any other, can't any other thing. Yeah. No. And you got to pay whatever you have to pay, whatever the cost is to get them. So you can continue to work, which is then also pushing more digital naturally because with metal printing, the only consumables we have are the metal powder and the nitrogen. So that yeah. naturally wants you know makes you want to print more because you don't have these consumables that you're so dependent upon yeah and, and it's also because there's a, a bit more supply because it hasn't been as adopted as widely adopted yet so mm -hmm. the supply is far more stable so you're right um there's someone here roger uh who do i contact i know how to design metal partials in the past I co-instructed with Bago when they had the course at Vida. So uh, if you're looking for someone to reach out to, Roger, just uh, send us an email at Evident and we'll plug you into the team uh, after, after the show. And likewise, for anyone who's interested in uh, learning more about Tim's lab, uh, I know before uh, the show, we, we discussed that these at capacity right now, but uh, uh, he's starting to put together a wait list as they bring online more technology and more equipment. And it just takes time to, to set these things up and, you know, uh, big investment in 
in capital. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, we're putting together a wait list for you that uh, uh, when the capacity opens up, you'll, you'll start uh, contacting people again. Correct. Yeah, that, that would be ideal if we can maintain that list. Um, it seems like, you know, if you if you are serious and you want to be on that list, um, please do get on that because it seems like as soon as we roll a printer on that, you know, we can handle 40 to 50 more cases. Uh, it feels so, very fast. Last time it was about three weeks and it was, you know, we were full. So I'm not, I'm not just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know I referred some guys from Wisconsin to you, and uh, uh, they were like, uh, when I was chatting with them, they were like, well, we've never seen a 3D printed uh, cast partial that fits well, and, you know, they had all their, their reservations, and I said, I'm, I've got a guy for you to try, because <laughs> I know he does a great job. And they phone me back up and they go, wow. Oh, good. <laughs> it actually fits. That's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah. You know, they were like, wow. Yeah. And uh, their concern is that a lot of their guys are, you know, getting on in age and uh, they're slowing down and retiring. And there's no next generation of cast partial guys coming up the ranks you know right it's hard and well, to find and if you can and if you can have a guy in-house that can do a survey and design and put a basic pencil drawing down you are you are definitely ahead of the game and we have put out Bertram Dental Lab has put out training videos I've been working with Evident um, and we have eight eight videos now posted that link through our website that is complete three shape CAD design of doing RPDs. So it's, here's Bertram Dental Labs DME. And then I'm continuing to add to this library as we work with Evident um, to share that information because we we wanna work with that those labs that, uh, that have that workflow idea down the road. And, and from our part, all the labs that work with us were referring your way. So you yeah. know, it, it, I, I think that machine of yours, you might need two or three. Yeah, well, the well, lineup is getting, getting long. Yep, yep. <laughs> well, the last order we did when we first moved into this new new building, we did three three printers in that order. And uh, we did two, two additional this, uh, this month on order. Wow, well, uh, you know, I'm excited for that. And it's nice to know that when the machines go live, you'll already have the, the volume to support it. So that's that's even better, you know? Yeah. Uh, so just to get that comfort. But if you, I mean, uh, on the training videos, I should clarify, if, if, if uh, somebody wants info on the training videos, um, you know, contact Evident as well, and you can put them in contact with us because they are posted to our website. Uh, you just need a password to access uh, the link, and then uh, you can yeah. train up, you know, help train up your CAD team. Yeah, or if you need someone to just design it for you, let us know. Yeah. We'll we'll figure out the the design side piece. Uh, it certainly now that we've got our team scaled up, and you've been a big part of of expanding our team, it's it's nice to have that core competency now. You know. Um, Here's a question. Were you able to expand your capacity by going digital? And we're swamped and are looking for ways to scale up. You know, yeah, I, we, I was going to say it's not as simple as just buying a machine though, right? So, Right. Um, it was kind of twofold because we had our traditional work, our analog work, I'll say, and our, our digital workflow where we were accepting the files from customers. And that scaled up um, naturally on its own more easily. So yeah, we scaled up, definitely scaled up with uh, the, the new technology. But to your point, there there is a lot more involved. You have to learn how to heat treat and how to support, and then also how to post-process your RPDs. And, and if someone wants to build like a, let's say get the machine, machine and all the, the stuff that you've got, yep. how much do they need to spend? 
to to depends on can you give me a number like they they want to do say how many per day so let's say 50 partials a day i'm going to say probably around 2 million to really so it's no joke yeah to really scale up for that yeah 40 50 partials so um and typically, what's your turnaround time for cases? If someone sends you a digital file, somebody what's the turnaround? Sends, yeah, somebody sends us a digital file. It's two days in lab for an unfinished case. So that's just a sandblasted finish. So if you okay. upload on a, let's say, Monday before uh -huh. 3 o'clock Central, we would then ship that on Wednesday. So Monday before 3 Tuesday, Wednesday. So two days in house, they get it uh, three days later. Yep. And Pretty much as fast as you could do doing it on your own. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty fast. And if you do the pre-polished finish, it's one additional day. Okay. Uh, and what do you see your biggest challenges today, Tim? Scaling, continuing to scale. Yep. I mean, it's a nice, it's a high class problem, but the problem nonetheless, isn't it, you know? Right. It's like that, yeah. yeah. Right. And I, I mean, when, when you look at what's going on in the denture world, you know, with all the 3D printed dentures and have you, do you have any insight to what goes above the class partials or do you see any of the things that are going on? I don't, uh, in, I don't see world. a lot yeah. of it um, other than in the flexible world. You know, I see um, more of that with the, with the valplast and, and doing the uh, milling of the teeth and, and merging that with a, with a valplast frame, things like that. Um, but as far as the 3D printed dentures, the full dentures, I, I don't see a lot of that on my end. Yeah, and as I was mentioning to Tim uh, when we were chatting before the show, I mean, I'm seeing companies with, you know, uh, 3D printed zirconia, 3D printed titanium, and they're all looking at the, the cast partial market, trying to find out what the opportunity is and whether the technology will work. Uh, so. I'm curious where where it will end up. Right? Well, I'm seeing I'm seeing more too in the in the metal when you talk about uh, the different metal printing. So with selective laser melting, you know, I don't know if people are totally familiar with that technology, but it's that powdered alloy bed. Um, and there's there's technology out there that's uh, I'm trying to think of the correct name. It's metal deposition, where it's it's powder laid down and then a binder laid on top of that. And then that final part is sintered or heat treated to make your final. I don't see that technology working for RPDs. Um, everything I've, I've seen and experienced in metal deposition, the final part is too brittle to be an RPD. Uh, no. Yeah, what's interesting is listening to you, you're not so much a a lab expert or a dental expert as you are now a materials expert. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I, being I, able to understand all the newest materials in the in the dental space. Yeah, you have to know that. And, and also a little bit of additive and a little bit of machining. It's kind of like you're like this little hybrid uh, engineer in our, in our team of CAD, CAD people that run the machines too. They're just very versed in a yeah. lot of areas. It's like, you know, the actual design of the RPDs. I mean, guys like us do that and send it to you. Right. But now it's understanding all the materials and all the processes and that expertise, that's no longer dental lab expertise, that's materials and 3D printing expertise, right? Right. You, you could 3D print body parts, hips, whatever. <laughs> yeah. As long as you understand, you know, what goes on, then you're good to go. Right. Interesting. Now we've got a uh, 
final poll here just to make sure that people who want credits uh, or want any information on evident digital design services. And if anyone wants to be on the wait list for Bertram Dental Lab as they expand their capacity, then let us know as well. And, you know, just write down to call you and uh, we'll contact you and get your name and uh, prepare that list for Tim. That was our, our commitment to get him to agree to do a webinar with us. <laughs> it's like uh, at this point in time. <laughs> so, um, in, any parting words for the industry in general, Tim? I mean, I consider you definitely one of the innovators in this space today. And uh, in fact, I'm, I'm grateful that, uh, you know, uh, you ended up dealing with us and through that, I was introduced to you and uh, really fascinating story. I, I, I quite enjoyed the discussion on the technology, you know, so. No, um, I, I appreciate I appreciate the invite to the show. And I just, I think party, parting words, I would say, you know, I, th I think everybody is doing their best in adapting to materials and manufacturing processes. And we've come a long way in five years, you know, everybody that's involved in the industry. So, you know, cut yourself a break when you have a machine go down and you got these tight turnaround times that you're not the only one in that boat. Yeah, I think what I learned uh, from listening to you is uh, that this whole industry is evolving so quickly that people are developing their expertise in production based on what focus they have in the industry. And there's, you know, groups of people all over the world, such as yourself, that have mastered certain aspects of this new technology that's coming down or have put together uh, equipment from different industries yep. to be able to master the output. And that's no simple feat. I mean, you know, like I wouldn't know where to begin if I went, okay, I gotta figure out how to come up with, you know, RPDs that fit like you made them in house. and all these different customers, all these different parameters, how do we make sure that, that uh, you know, they all work the same way? Well, that's pretty good. And uh, congratulations to you. I think you've done an excellent job, man. And uh, I look forward to seeing your business scale up because I do think it's one of the, if not the leading, certainly one of the leading uh, RPD labs in the United States today. So well done, man. Thank you, I appreciate that. And uh, for all the attendees, again, thanks for uh, spending an hour with us. Tim, thank you for, I know you're swamped, so thank you for sharing uh, your time with us. And I hope you guys all have a busy week and uh, stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, guys.